you might not think that Lincoln, Nebraska is a small town, but it is, according to Jeff Carney. And many of the things that he learned as a kid, particularly from his parents, helped really derive an incredible work ethic. And his experiences are so varied, and they've helped him today start an incredible company called Carney Photography. You're going to learn all about it today on the Leadership Lessons from Mayberry. Well, listen, this is going to be a ton of fun because you have one of the most varied backgrounds of anyone that I've talked to, and we're going to dig into that a little bit later. But we always start with your Mayberry uh, because this show is about how how you were shaped, how you were formed, and it all starts in the town in which you come from. And so you're a Lincoln, a Lincoln guy. But tell us about your Mayberry. What was it like growing up in Lincoln? It was, you know what, small town. Uh, I go back not often, uh, even though it's that close to where we live. Uh, but it it's still a small town. Always enjoyed it. Uh, great, uh, great friends. I still stay connected with to this day. We grew up in a small neighborhood that doesn't look anything like it did. What was it? What was the neighborhood? Uh, Metal Lane. Metal Lane. Oh, yeah. yeah. But we yeah. were south of the railroad tracks, um, not quite the lake area around Lincoln East, Wedgwood Lake, um, where some several friends were from, but love it. And uh, it was influential, you know, high school experience, uh, classroom and sports certainly forced a discipline. And you learn that at a young age and scrappy, competitive uh, the mean, I always joke the mean streets of Lincoln. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I got to hear this. Cause you seem like you'd fit right into the mean streets. I'm telling you, Jeff, <laughs> when you say small town, there's going to be a lot of people who are like Lincoln, Nebraska is not a small town. So tell me about that. Well, and was it then? Well, compared to Omaha, they, yeah. where we would go, you know, uh, to, to go out to eat or go on a date or something. Omaha seemed like the big city yeah. compared to Lincoln. And we didn't know any better. You know, you, we traveled to Denver, or traveled to Chicago, and and it just seemed like Lincoln was always small. It still feels that way, even with the university being such a big part of it. But I, no, I don't know. Uh, it just seemed small. You knew a lot of people. Uh, it 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 looks like great memories. Girl. Yeah. So what was a Friday night? like in the summertime a wednesday night in the summertime in lincoln nebraska what filled oh, your nights my goodness uh so depend you know in high school or out of high school you know certainly sports uh you we you know, play softball after we were out of school flag football in the fall I stayed pretty active with city rec stuff but uh, cars were always an important part of things had some muscle cars. Ah. And like, like the speed was always fun. Still is to this day. <laughs> My wife would shoot me for that, but I do enjoy uh, enjoy that. But no, I, great time. Friends hanging out. Uh, it's just uh, you know we had a lot of friends. It's interesting that we live north of Ashland today yeah. in Lake Country, but back then we had friends that had places uh, at some of the private lakes in Fremont. So summertime. We'd be road tripping up to Fremont. Somebody would drive. We'd go up and hang out in the sun and lake and water. And and uh, so that's a habit that never went away. Yeah. You know, growing up, I had this pizza joint that a bunch of us would hang out because they had video games. The first ever Pac-Man right, sure. and all that. Where was your hangout? What was oh, it? Oh, my goodness. Where would you guys go to congregate? Eating, yeah. Eating me a little bit here. King's. King's. Rest cheese, French cheese. Cheese, French yeah. cheese. Used to be at... Uh, uh, 70th and O Streets. I think they paved paradise and put up a, something there now. But that Kings was a hangout, especially after football games and other things in the fall. But uh, And then to the summer to a certain degree. But you know what? Parks, great parks. Pioneers Park out in uh, West Lincoln. Always fun to go cruise, hang out, and be out there. And but we'd play golf and do a bunch of different things around. There was just lots of stuff to do always in, in Lincoln Yeah, uh, because of its size. You know, and and I dig a little bit here because what you do today at Carnegie Photography is so much wildlife, and we're going to get into that a little bit later. So where did you get introduced as, to wildlife? As a kid, or did it come later? No, that as as a kid, probably uh, high school friends, we'd pheasant hunt. Uh, and so the outdoors, uh, scouting, by the way, let's go step back before even high school. My love of the outdoors probably came from that scouting experience. Scouting family. My dad was a scout master. And uh, uh, so those trips, 
high adventure trips to the mountains to you know backpack for a week and do those things. That, Colorado, that Colorado, New Mexico, Philmont National Scout Reservation of, in New Mexico. Those those trips just burn that that love for the outdoors into me. Then then the hunting came just because other friends hunted. And it's interesting. I still do that today, but I have a lot more fun with a camera in my hand than a than a rifle. You know, I um, I got to harken back here. My stepfather passed away a few years ago, and when we were going through his stuff, we came across a card, and he uh, had gone pheasant hunting as a kid. And he's he's probably about eight or nine years, ten years older than you, but he had counted the amount of pheasants he got that oh day. My. And birds in general. And I don't hunt, so you probably know more than I. But the number was staggering. It's not the same today, is it? I mean, you can't go out and just find as many, or or is it? No, it ebbs and flows depending on the season. But certainly South Dakota, our neighbors to the north, much bigger. Pheasant is a much bigger business, agribusiness for for, uh, those north of us. But still great memories. We were fortunate. My grandparents were farmers. We have farm ground in our family. And and could always had some place to go, uh, but again, it was funny uh, growing up. We still had friends that that fi- I didn't fish as much. I do that more now, um, but any excuse uh, for my wife and I, our kids, to, to be outdoors. Much winters are getting harder the older we get, just because we love being outside so much. Yeah, that's that is something that we sometimes miss in Nebraska in the cold winters. But you know, you mentioned your parents earlier, and I know. Uh, they had such a huge impact on you growing up. Talk about them a little bit, the way they raised you and, and all those memories, uh, you know, and, and the things you learned from them as well. So discipline, uh, you, you learned quickly uh, there were consequences for bad choices. <laughs> Darn it. I hope they're not listening to our conversation <laughs> today. But no, uh, starting in scouting, you know, we'd, we'd goof off. Uh, whole pranks, you know, that hazing of young scouts. And uh, <laughs> my my dad is Zine Carney. Uh, that's my middle name. And, and uh, they labeled him Mean Zine in those days, which is really funny because today they're 85, still with us, and uh, there's not a mean bone in the guy's body. But uh, So he was he a disciplinarian. He was a disciplinarian. Okay. Yeah, so mom, like, mom kind of. The answer was just wait till your dad gets home and. <laughs> That was usually enough to put the fear of God in you. But no, a, a strong work ethic. Uh, you you work hard to get to where you want to go. Uh, it just in that discipline. I think it definitely started at home. Uh, he was in the commercial printing business and journalism. They had a group of grew it into a group of four community newspapers. So I always joked because we worked for him part time, and we worked part time at a really young age at the commercial printing company and so you you earned a paycheck you know i could be in middle school and it was nice you realize hard work that there would be a reward for that and um we didn't have a lot of our summers we didn't have much off because we spent a lot of time at the shop so there but it's just you just develop that work ethic and that sticks with me today i'd, I'd like to think without a doubt and your your father's name though i've always loved and growing up in ashland of course he owned the paper the ashland mm-hmm. gazette was a publisher and I always remember that name, Zine. Tell me where it came from. So old, and I know it's your middle name. The old family name, firstborn, uh, alternating generation. So his father was uh, Arlen Zine. He's Zine Edward. I'm Jeffrey Zine. So got it. We didn't have a boy. It's, so uh, uh, my brother did, and and uh, has, did he get it? Name? He did. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's so great to hear those stories about your parents as well, because as you mentioned, that work ethic, it seems to be just a common theme that the, the folks that I've interviewed, that work ethic instilled at such a young age. And, you know, it, it just seemed like that maybe that was an exp- expectation in the Carney household. That's what the norm was. You yeah. didn't, we didn't really know anything else. Has it changed, you think, over years? I mean, today, is it... I... I hate to say that. No, I think our, our when I look to our children and what they've accomplished, uh, they're they're hardworking. Um, so maybe that some critics or cliche would be to say it has changed, but I they see it. They realize what hard work can can lead to, and and uh, I I sometimes worry a little bit about, especially with our kids, uh, work life balance. That's something maybe we didn't have when we were younger, but um, I know that. Uh, that would be one thing that would make me nervous, but no, I, I, I still see it. I've been fortunate. 
um, those around us were tired of had good success and hope that continues. Yeah. Well, you took that work ethic and man, what a, I just love your story. I love your career because you, you got the, uh, you got the hoops, uh, dreams going back in high school. First off, tell me about a basketball player. You went to Lincoln East. So went to Lincoln what kind East. of hoops player were you? Uh, not very average, very average, but we had an incredibly talented, uh, group, uh, junior, senior year that went on to play division one basketball. I uh, won a state championship my senior year had a little more fun on the football field too. ran a little bit of track at East, but uh, very average to, to say the least, but passionate, loved basketball, um, wanted to coach, uh, and, and continue on with it. I just loved that sport so much and enjoyed it. We played a lot of basketball in Ashland yeah. uh, when, when I lived there in the community my first time around and, and enjoyed that. So, um, until the knees started to go that, that, um, it was hard to get that word from the orthopedic surgeon. It's time to put court sports aside. That was that was painful. Well, I can imagine. Well, you know, I always find folks that want to coach, they normally had a coach that really inspired them. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I know you played for Paul Forch, right? Yeah. Uh, would have been him, and he had some great years there. But well, where did the inspiration come from coaching? You know, this, I think that was more just enjoying the classroom uh, you know, Paul, I probably had more association with Forch when he was a JV football coach uh, um, as well. And John Henry was a, another assistant coach that was the head baseball coach at, at East who lived down the street. Uh, bought my first GTO, my first car ever from John Henry. Uh, so great memories there. But uh, just looking at the influence they had on, on, on students, young, young high school students, knowing the patience that they had to have to put up with us. Uh, we were probably, some of us were high maintenance um, <laughs> and maybe misbehaved a little bit, but yeah, I just, those were influential, but the biggest thing, just enjoying working with young people. Um, and I, I still to this day, even though I didn't go into education, I love being in the classroom. I teach, uh, have taught adjunct faculty at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, adjunct faculty at Creighton uh, as well in uh, journalism programs there. And so that now you know that's, to that's taboo, right? You know you can't do Creighton and Nebraska, right? That is, Isn't that a, with <laughs> Jaysker or what do they call them? It's, yeah, I was conflicted, <laughs> but uh, it worked out well for my uh, my schedule before our company grew, and then suddenly traveling the the crazy thing they want you to be in town to teach. Uh, you couldn't, uh, but my travel schedule made that hard toward the end. But yeah, but no great memories, and always have enjoyed being around uh, younger people learning. And especially with the athletics. Yeah, it's funny how careers take a turn. You go from wanting to be a coach, Peru State, your knee starts to give you problems. So you're like, all right, maybe maybe journalism is a little bit better on the body. And so initially, are you thinking, I want to be a writer and be in publishing a little like your father? Or are you thinking photography all the way? I, at, in, at Lincoln, at the School of Journalism there at Anderson Hall, they didn't have a photo discipline. It was part of the news editorial sequence. And I do remember disappointing a professor, uh, Bud Pagel, early in my career. Uh, I thought I was good at writing. He thought I was good at writing, wanted to encourage that. I had more fun documenting life uh, as a photojournalist. And he was kind of upset when I opted to go really pursue photojournalism full-time rather than, than the reporting. He never never forgave me for that. But uh, it's it's... It was just something I really connected with. Uh, and then, by the way, you know, being attracted to sports, covering sports, other things, it was just those areas I was passionate about. And that's the so area. A good transition. Yeah, you seem to gravitate, obviously, sports and wildlife. So wh where was that moment, though, where you're like, this is it? I know I enjoy photography. I know this is what I want to do. Was there a moment? Was it more incremental? Well, I was so in college, besides working for one of my parents' community newspapers that gave me a great taste for things but that still involved a lot of other work the writing the pagination putting the newspaper together I, the, the the photography is what stood out so frankly um, I was fortunate enough in college at the university in Lincoln to be a stringer for the AP throughout school it paid better than the daily Nebraskan Mm -hmm. And with, I did, did, you know where you're going yeah. there. And you get a national, a national audience too, you, right? With the AP. Exactly. Yeah. Your work would appear in, in national publications. And, and so I enjoyed that. But there were some pretty big stories that I just happened to be fortunate to be around. When United Flight 232 crashed in Sioux City, yeah. uh, Nebraska, I was out, Sioux City, Iowa, sorry. I was out actually mowing my lawn and 
The phone rang. It was New York calling, saying, you're the closest photographer we have, roll. I remember driving. Probably should admit this on on well, you said you like to be asked, and <laughs> I made record time from Lincoln to uh, Sioux City to cover that big story. It was a huge story. I didn't realize it at the time. And then being close, I, it was a story that went on for you know almost a couple of weeks. Absolutely, it had a great turn out, you know, where no one died, fortunately. But it was a big story, and it gave you that taste, that adrenaline, the the big news events. Uh, so that that's it's addictive. Yeah, the adrenaline, right? And being around great colleagues, great competitors, it 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 was a way to channel that competitive. We're all competitive by nature. I think those of us that, that pursue certain things, and I could translate that sports competition to to the field, yeah, to the work. And, and you really have, you know, a line that just goes almost vertical, right? You started at a very small paper in Ashland, Nebraska, the Ashland Gazette. But then you, you're you're on the staff photographer of AP that you mentioned, and and I think you had to move down to Kansas City. Um, you get an opportunity to go to the Moines Register for five years. Was that really what you would call your first big break? No, I, Kansas City, I would say with AP. AP yeah, okay. And, and moving from Stringer to a staff role was important, and that was a big step. I was very fortunate for my age to to be able to to step. Things worked out; they fell into place for me, but. To be fair, Kansas City was fantastic. I enjoyed it. The breaking news was crazy. Uh, you know, tornadoes in western Kansas, uh, sporting events in Columbia, Missouri, uh, covering the Tigers. Um, by the way, I know we think things are crazy when Iowa comes to town, but covering a KU, Missouri basketball game in the dead of winter. Uh, no and, love lost, right? No, no. <laughs> and, but so, so much fun to be around that, but it was... A, you were on the road every day with a two-state, almost a two-state uh, coverage area. Uh, and frankly, covering, I was never a big baseball fan. I was always the tall, skinny kid that they threw hard and inside at. <laughs> and covering the Royals at a time where they weren't really that good, it was right after the I-70 series. Yeah. And there were many nights of rain delays at Kauffman Stadium and other things I realized I don't really like covering baseball. But 60-some games... Um, you you prayed for football season. I can imagine, and I have to tell you though, don't feel bad. That that fastball inside part of the plate, toughest play, pitch to hit, Jeff. So so don't don't be too hard on yourself. So thank you. They always managed to find me. I just never could connect the bat with that ball. Yeah, that's why they hit me ninth too. I I had the same problem. So you get to the Moine, things are going great. Um, but what I love about your trajectory is that. Lo and behold, Nebraska football plays a role in your career. After five years in Des Moines, tell me that story. How you get on so, with the Omaha World Herald? But so, but before I, five years, wonderful time. It was the glory days, if you will, of of newspapering because a lot of things right. have changed. That business has been disrupted, as everybody knows. The uh, for me, my time in Des Moines kind of sets up what what would do in in Omaha later, but. Uh, we had uh, a Pulitzer Prize winner on staff, David Peterson, amazing talent who covered the farm crisis in the 80s, late 80s. Uh, sports covering the Hawkeyes, covering the Cyclones and Ames, really great high school sports, crazy in, in Iowa. We had the floods, the great floods of 93 and, and the craziness. But the downtown staff. Des Moines, right? The, well, my God, the Mississippi River, Des Moines flooded. Uh, there are entire staff photo staff lived in other parts of Des Moines that didn't have water for two weeks. Uh, we had the one house in West Des Moines that had water. So we turned it, um, Doug Wells, one of my former coworkers reminded me that I used to trade six packs for a shower, come to my house and I'll, I'll take a, a hot shower for six pack, but great, great time, great friends to this day. I still stay in touch with some, but that opportunity came Nebraska played in the 94 orange bowl. Some senior leadership at the Omaha World Herald weren't happy with how uh, the game coverage went. Of course, this is kind of a, uh, I should have been a foretelling of what was going to come. But they, uh, a lot of pressure covering Huskers, a lot of competition, a lot of pressure to put together a great photo package and a story package from a game. So I, I got a phone call right after that season, and they started to, uh, recruit me to come to Omaha eventually. And I didn't make the decision right away, but at some point it was a chance to come home. 
Uh, they, the job was in the Lincoln Bureau and would have been covering home and away Husker sports, uh, high school tournaments, those that were all in Lincoln, and then the state. We traveled the state at that time covering things. And so it was an easy decision to make. Uh, my first assignment was in uh, January of, of that following year at some little event down in Tempe, Arizona called yeah. Fiesta Bowl. Mm-hmm. So number right. two championship, number right? Two uh, championship for Coach Osborne. For Coach Osborne. A little piece of history. I missed the first year, which now looking back, I think that was a big year, decade, or t- team to to lose. But getting that chance, if you got a second for a funny story, yeah. one of my very evil, dark co-workers, <laughs> unbeknownst to me, told my colleagues that when they learned that I had been hired, it was kind of a, you know, they were excited, but yet, oh no, that means there's more competition for the good assignments. And the only ticket the the newsroom could get for me to get to Tempe from Omaha was a first class ticket. All the others were sold out to get into in time to cover the game. This colleague of mine mentions to the rest of the staff, "Well, that's in Carney's contract. The only way he's going to travel is first class," which wasn't true. <laughs> oh, I didn't find out until a little later. And it's like, oh, a great way to get to know a new bringing staff. in a prima, prima donna. donna. <laughs> <laughs> It was a nice ride down, but trust me, it was coach with a connection going home. So. What a life. You get a job, you go first class to Arizona in January, and you get the Fiesta Bowl. I, I mean, that is just spoiled. First and last national championship, first and last first class trip <laughs> for work uh, in my, the rest of my career. So. so you didn't get the 97 game then? Oh, I did. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I, forget, yep. I forgot yeah. about that little, yep. oh, yeah. And yeah. so, but again, pressure, the pressure of covering them my my favorite moment from 1997 season a former uh, well former coach uh, who was a quarterback at that time Scott Frost that game in Missouri there were three of us at that game and the undefeated season on the line nobody realized it that Missouri Tigers take him down to the wire and some freshman receiver by the name of Matt Davison catches his miracle ball in the end zone I happened to be the right place at the right time and and got the sequence of the catch and uh, anyway, I won't go into great detail, but uh, it was something no one else had. AP picked it up from, from me to distribute in, or from the World Herald, too. And, but it was one of those pressure moments when we were driving home from that game. No yeah. first class. It was a company car. That's right. It was piled in it. It was very quiet because we realized, great, we got the shots, but we were this close for you radio folks, an inch oh. uh, away from, had we missed that, we'd probably all be working fast food. Yeah, um, you, because they expect that. I mean, that's the expectation was you would capture it. Yeah, and you know. Three of us were in position, in almost perfect position. We hadn't shot an overtime football game before. So done our homework, kind of knew what to do, where to be. But only one of us of the three ended up getting in um, of that moment, capturing it, and fortunately, somebody we did yeah so. and, and i would imagine the place to be would have been that end zone right it would have not been. the opposite end zone or was it it was in the end zone where they were going to drive to for the game winning or that it just tied it up to send it into overtime that catch and then frost managed to engineer another touchdown in overtime to win it i want to know the key here i got to understand the key to photography oh. is it is it almost like the wild west where how quick you are to be able to to, to click is it is it is what is it that allows you to get that shot really good question i think it's preconceiving what could happen running through scenarios in your head not overthinking it it's all a matter of about I mean, photojournalism photojournalism the best stuff that i admire that i see people do it's all about moments they capture a moment an important moment sometimes depending yeah. on history or the sporting event but right place anticipating that it's going to happen sometimes you miss swing and miss but at least you're thinking and positioning and trying to do it but it's eye hand coordination especially um, being able to capture that frame it that's kind of the fun part of wildlife the things i do now by the way pretty low pressure i don't have editors calling me wondering a when am i going to file b did you get the right moment but it's still you've got to capture the it's anticipating you're anticipating action if you Tr- pull the trigger on the camera or the, the shutter the the when it happens you're probably going to be late yeah so, so somebody ask you catching it before yeah so the fact that you played football you said you got to anticipate it 
you played football at Lincoln East. Did that help you? I mean, I don't know any of us. I think if I remember, it was a fake dive and then a rollout, right? Yeah. So I don't know if anyone would have called that. But was there just something instinctively, maybe because you played football, that allowed you to follow that? Yeah. And, of course, the hand-eye coordination doesn't hurt that you were an athlete, I right? think well, one eye on the quarterback – and then watching what the line is doing, what are they setting up the pass block? So without a doubt, playing sports, growing up, had to, you, you know you can anticipate what you see what the line is doing, you see what receivers are doing, you know who's loafing, and there's no way they're going to get the ball thrown to them. You know somebody running a hard route, and you knew they needed to get to the end zone to 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 get it into overtime. So yeah, anticipation and and having a sense of scene, but your, your eyes have to be wide open to, to try to track it, catch that. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. Greatest shot. The greatest shot you feel like you've ever got. Oh man. It was, let, and let me start here. I want the greatest really sports good. shot that you feel like you've ever gotten in the greatest shot. That's a really great question. Sports shot, sports moment. Well, yeah. certainly the Fiesta Bowl is something that I'll always go back. Was to. there one shot, though, in that game? I no. mean, because the Davidson get is, you the know. The miracle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that was maybe that, that hard to top. But, Tim, here's the downside today with the, the recent struggles in Lincoln. <laughs> I'll bring up. Uh, I'll put it in my portfolio or have it online, and somebody's got to look at Miracle of Missouri. What? There's a generation that doesn't know <laughs> yeah, anything sad. about Yeah, Nebraska was in the same conference as Missouri. Yes. Um, maybe that moment was certainly got a lot of interest and in, in, in sold a lot of copies to, to other publications, licensed that. But um, that's hard to, on the sports front. Yeah. That's yeah. Well, I, I, that's a goodie. That's a real good. The Rose Bowl was pretty cool, uh, but the Fiesta Bowl probably the Tommy Frazier's long run um, that bouncing around that that ended up broke up of Florida. Florida, Florida. Yeah, that, that was a moment that. But it, really, more the events. Some of my best images, probably most people don't care about, coming from state tournaments, high schools. Yeah, the emotions are raw. And, and you're close. It's not a business like it is for at the college and pro level. So I, I'd say that mm-hmm. for sports. Yeah. Anything outside of sports that you say is memorable, whether we would know or not know. Well, you know, I'm going to argue my, the, the, my best work I'm going to be proud of, I hope, is around the corner. Yeah. And I haven't taken it yet. But uh, working, I mean, during... The floods in 93, President Bill Clinton came to uh, after, in the immediate aftermath, and it was devastating to the community, uh, those, the, those floods up and down the Mississippi River, too. It wasn't just Iowa that was, had a bad 93 summer, but a, a pretty touching moment between uh, a, a woman who was in line for water and, and the president, and it's a photo op. You're in the pool, tight pool with the president, it's, it's cattle call. You're in there, everybody's shooting the same moment, and it's crazy that I captured something that some of my competitors that, that were there that didn't. And so that was fun when the paper came out the next day. Um, and you and had that, yeah. That was before Al Gore invented the internet. <laughs> <laughs> but but fun. That was rewarding. Yeah. But yeah, I, but you know what? I, I used a drone here just uh, last. An incredible shot. Thank, last year, thank you, um, to photograph Chimney Rock. Yes. My goal to show life from a different perspective, to show landscapes from a different perspective. And so that, that's that been rewarding in a very different way. You, maybe you need to be from Nebraska to appreciate that, but um, it is a fun. gorgeous shot. We're going to talk about that when we get to Carney Photography, and we're going to make sure they can go and see it. Um, you captured it, and, and a great story behind there because you had such a small window to shoot it, so we'll talk about that. But I, I got hung up here with Fiesta Bowl and, and all of this stuff. Let's talk about you getting the leadership. You get to Omaha World Herald, and walk us through that because you start out doing something that you didn't end up doing, and you got into leadership and management. So walk us through that process. 2001, so I arrived in, in, in Lincoln that, that Fiesta Bowl year, 95, and... Uh, Worked out of our Lincoln Bureau for a, a number of years, and then Omaha called and wanted me to be part of, of some of the transformation that was going on in Omaha. Uh, that included a new com- uh, printing plant, which is a major thing for the newspaper going from letterpress, old technology, to brand new offset. So really nice reproduction. Again, go back to my upbringing, being around the commercial printing business most of my life. I knew a lot about offset printing. Not as much as my brothers, but still quite a bit. 
uh, who, who, by the way, are still in the commercial printing business. But long and short of it, it was a, a chance to be part of the solution uh, to, you know, you complain enough about how things are being run and then they want you to come and step <laughs> they, into it. And you do it. So it, it was a chance for me to to try to improve things, uh, to, to change, you know, we the digital disruption was coming and it was nice to be kind of in the lead and a chance to work with some other great folks, great leaders at the newspaper, publisher, executive editor, Larry King, to get to that point and, and work with them. So I felt my contributions were stepped up, the responsibilities went up, and it was rewarding professionally. And at one point, I believe you're overseeing digital content for over 60 papers around the country that were owned by Berkshire. And yep. then of course, Lee Enterprises comes in in 2020 and they buy you out. So here, here's, and then you work for them, right? The thing that we, when we went through this and we discussed it, the first thing that hit me was, I mean, you've got some shut spot to say, Hey, I want to go into leadership. I want to do this. Having come from Honestly, more the journalism field. Where, why did you know you had it in you to be that kind of a leader? That's a tr um, great question, too. I, I always felt like I could contribute more than a, but at some point, the the routine of the coverage and things we were doing, get, and what a fantastic job looking back at it now to be paid and equipped to travel the state. Travel, we did foreign trips too, to, to for important stories like immigration. And it was rewarding, but I knew there was something more I wanted to help, especially the visual side of our operation. I oversaw design, the newspaper design, uh, and later the web piece of that, the digital part was given to me too. It just, it was an opportunity to make positive changes as the business model was, we saw it as evolving, not necessarily the disruption at that point. So it was it's, more, you were out ahead of it in a way. In your just, mind. In I mean, my you... mind, I knew I was more fascinated. I saw a greater reward with the challenge of the digital side of the business. And so yeah, I gravitated toward that. I also, the print side, I'd been there and, and done a lot of different roles over the years. It, it, the digital was more in, interesting to me, especially when you get into the audience and what does an audience want to consume, uh, what are we producing the right types of content? Are we reaching them? You know, the model, when it disrupted, uh, print was and still continues to be an important part of the business, especially on the revenue side of things. But on the digital side, being able to connect, especially when we became, when the World Herald Company became Berkshire Hathaway Media Group, we had news, news markets in the Virginia, the Carolinas, Alabama, Florida, which, by the way, was wonderful to uh, to be spending and doing time with them in uh, especially January and February. Yeah, but it was uh, important to look at each individual market to work at work with them on improving the uh, content they were doing, connecting it with readers wherever they wanted to be on the platform they preferred. Uh, phones were just taking off, so that. I mean, we went from the second wave of disruption was going away from desktop to to all of a sudden producing a website and a, an experience with content on the phone that would entice, would keep you know, older demographics and younger engaged as well. Hey, we're going to take a quick break in the show so that you know about Farmers and Merchants Bank of Ashland, the sponsor of Leadership Lessons from Mayberry. You know, few banks can say they've been around for 139 years, but Farmers and Merchants Bank of Ashland has. Why? Because they are locally owned, locally managed, and they are focused on you. They offer full service business banking and you're always going to talk to a live person when you give them a call. They're commercial lenders. They are more than happy to share their expertise and to help you navigate any business financing that you may need, including SBA, TIF, or NEDCO financing. Check them out at fmnb.com or give them a call at 402 944 3316. Member FDIC and Equal Housing Lender. I think what's also intriguing about it is 
there's this perception that it's the 20 somethings that are interested in digital. Right. And here you are later in your career and you're like, I'm taking this on. I'm excited. Um, talk to me about that mindset. First, because I'm terrified still of technology, no, but and that's all right. That is not. But not you embraced embrace it. it. What well, you know, it's that's the it's we all are learners. We're constantly learning new things. And for me, yeah, you're right. That didn't come with we didn't grow up in high school uh, with journalism classes that were teaching you know, web and social media. That was something you all had to learn and acquire. So that was a challenge to keep current and and leading edge with what was working and what would work in our markets. But that's, it goes back to the classroom, putting on workshops, working with the newsroom to teach and coach them toward uh, being more successful with the content they were producing. That, that was the exciting, that was the challenge to it. Man, every day was something new, something different. It was never a one-size-fits-all plan, but I also had leadership at BH Media Group at the Berkshire Hathaway Media Group that had expectations for growth. And that sometimes conflicted with individual markets who maybe resented somebody coming in from outside. So you were balancing. You had to come in and be the peacemaker. And, and by the way, you realize we're all in sales. I you talked about that, that early in the yes. Coming in and selling people who weren't interested in what you had to offer was challenging. And so that all kind of played, I've never done sales in my life, but yet I have. Yeah, I never had to, to live on commission only, I guess is maybe a good way to put that. But it all combined where it was just a, a, an exciting time. It was rewarding when things would work. We had some situations where things didn't work in some markets, but interestingly enough, it wasn't the tools. Everybody wanted to point to the tools, get me the newest tools and I'll be able to succeed. In some cases it was back to leadership. Right. And I always say, but to your point, um, I have a wife, Wendy Boyer, who does not read the printed newspaper. She reads the Omaha World Herald every day from front to back on her phone. And digitally. Mm -hmm. Phone. Yeah, she not rarely desktop, always on her phone. And I will say that just because of age, some of our best, I look back to the Omaha World Herald newsroom. Steve Jordan was a longtime business reporter for the World Herald. He embraced social media. In when Berkshire Hathaway meeting, the annual meeting would roll around. There was nobody better at at engaging online audiences. And again, older, seasoned mm-hmm. reporter who had huge success. He would, in many cases, you look to a younger staffer as somebody that you would think would have those skills because they were taught in college. Not necessarily. And and so it was always fun to sit back and watch the success they would have. The sports, sports staff in, in Omaha, always engaged and, and did so well. Yeah. Same thing. They they were ahead of their time and, and a lot of great examples. Sports is breaking news. You need to think fast. You're a lot of competition out there, especially um, digitally when when the internet went crazy. Yeah. Um, but that means, means your content can get to more places than it would traditionally through a printed product. So here's the one thing I miss. And by the way, I'm just like your wife. I, my favorite thing on Sunday morning was to get the, the mm-hmm. printed paper, sit on the back deck with coffee when the weather was nice and read that paper. Loved it. I never thought, and now I do everything on the phone. I, I read the World Herald and Lincoln Journal Star on the phone. So ironically, this dog learned some new tricks. <laughs> But the one thing I'll just story, let's, let's just take a side, you know, with me, let's just take a, a left turn here all of a sudden. The one thing that I hope we never lose, and I want your perspective on this, the writing, and of course, I, I yeah. mostly read sports, Sam um, uh, McEwen and, and Tom Chattel, I just, Dirk Chatlin, just phenomenal writers. My worry is when we continue to gravitate towards digital, we're going to lose that great writing because do, do you think there's a risk of that? I don't. I, I do. It's not because of the, the medium that, whether it's in print, whether it's online, it's not the, the form that that content comes to you in. It's the business model. And that's what is being challenged because print revenue is really hard to replace. And the that part, of course, you worry about that as uh, newsrooms are getting smaller. Omaha is a fraction of the size today that it was when I was there in in office and working full-time it's been in decline but you know which which broadcast newsrooms are smaller i just saw kptm 
a Fox affiliate in Omaha is no longer going to have local news. So it's it's a real threat that that disruption and and the the consolidation out there. It's a challenging time. I I want to keep. I want to see that that quality writing, and that's what I'll gravitate to. But not enough people are willing to pay for that. And so when you don't support the model, right? Not, not for profit newsrooms, Flat Water, Water Press, and other examples. Some former talented uh, journalists from the World Herald are in that world now, and I read them online as well. They're they're funded. Uh, not-for-profit newsrooms and, and continue to do that good work. It'll appear in the World Herald too, that content, but you, the, the quality, and it does stand out. You, you read one bad story, one story, one poorly written story, and you realize how much you miss that yeah, that quality. For sure. And it's just the thinking. I mean, look at, at, at Sam McCune, and, and who's now the sports editor at the World Herald. You look at the packaging they'll do around stories that are so routine and you know, recruiting season and the neat things that they'll come up with, the ideas. And so it's just, you'll miss that creativity if it ever gets scaled back. Yeah, for sure. Well, I want to pull back here to your leadership because, as you know, leadership lessons from Mayberry, we're, we've got a lot to learn from you as well. Before we get into carny photography, I just keep, I keep tickling their, their interest here on carny photography. We're going to get there. But you said something, conflict, right? You you get into this role and you said there were some markets, you had 60 papers across the country, some markets that weren't as receptive to this new guy coming in talking about digital media. You're now the leader in this area. How did you deal with that? What's the first leadership lesson you can throw out to folks who say, business leaders who say, look, how do I deal with that kind of conflict? Uh, that's a a really important question. And by the way, it wasn't just conflict, you know, corporate ownership with local talent some of this was cultural when we're, we live in the midwest there is no such thing as sweet tea in ashland or <laughs> omaha nebraska when i would travel to the south uh, and eat, go into a restaurant and my favorite moment uh, dothan alabama or i'm sorry auburn alabama one of our markets there and going to lunch with the news editors and I look up and there was a vending machine for iced tea. You just got the cup at this restaurant and it was Northern tea and Southern tea. And so you realize, man, I am a long ways from home. So I, I played off of that. Be sure. Coming in without attitude, coming in using humor, just being real with people that they may not have liked the goals and targets that we had uh, set for us, but then justifying the reason for them. You know, they they all tie back to revenue. That's the, the the model as it's disrupted. Newsrooms suddenly realize that they are an important part of the revenue model, and so it was trying to explain what the the why behind decisions. But and never re realizing you were never going to convert everybody, and there were just some people that were turned off no matter what you did or said. But I think being real, being accessible, working hard. Uh, we you know we would leave on Sundays and travel back home on Friday nights. It was not a nine to five to, uh, Monday through Thursday gig, but that, that hard work, I think they saw that. And then the biggest thing was showing results, those little wins as well as bigger wins. Then we could say, you know, show them there's a method to this. We had action plans built in Excel. My, my VP, my boss, Doug Heemster was a big Excel guy and we had to map everything out that we would track success. We wouldn't just come in, throw a bunch of new initiatives and then leave. Yeah. We'd come in and then schedule follow-ups and check-ins on how are we coming and, and you're doing great in one category, you're behind in the other. Let's talk about why. So once they realize you weren't going to go away, which maybe was their experience in the past with other managers, then the relationship changed. And, and, for, and again, not everybody. Yeah. But the majority, vast majority, embraced it. Yeah. The, the upside or the downside, if they didn't embrace it, they usually figured this is, they're going to be consistent. They're not going away. And maybe I need to find something else to do. And so it staff churned and, and there was some turnover and, and yet others rose to the occasion. It just, it was rewarding to be a part of it. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I just interviewed Eric Sherman not too long ago. He uh, owns an engineering firm that you said, and it's funny how great leaders think alike. And, and I know you 
you all have this ability to kind of filter through and get to the answer. But he talked about, look, when you have conflict, it's empathy, right? And it's under explaining the why, making sure they understand the why behind it. Sounds like yep. those are some of those strategies that you use when you have conflict. And you can't win everyone, right? You can't win every win. And I was never great at poker. If we'd ever play, maybe we'll play some. Yeah, let's do now. I, it's not good. <laughs> And don't play golf with you either. <laughs> but it, it, that being a, even tempered and just never letting them see you, you know, at a high, high or a low, low, I think that helps too. If you put people at, the, at ease, but that empathy, he's spot on. That's huge. Yeah. Well, 2012, I take this back April of 2022. Um, you know, you decide to take an early buyout a retirement package and it's always interesting to me because folks that end up in this situation where they're like, okay, uh, you know, uh, tomorrow I don't go to work, right? It's funny how you just adapt. And for you, you're not ready to sit around. Um, you're ready to get something new started. So tell me about Carney Photography and how that opportunity to take that buyout provided you the opportunity to start a new business. So. Lee Enterprises was very good to me. I was one of a couple of people from the senior leadership team they kept, and I had a great run with them. But I knew, even back to the BH Media days, that that I probably wasn't going to end my career. I wanted to do something different. I thought that from early on. I wanted to go back to where I started toward the end of my working life. But we had started planning with the disruption and everything else that we just can't predict the future. You're not in control. And so when the time came for uh, the, in the conversations about buyouts and retirement, we were ready, we were prepared, and, and so we could do that. And so I was fortunate, very fortunate, and I have a supportive wife that, that allows us- Always to house. Happen. So it just, so it was great. And, and when the time came that Monday morning, I'll never forget, it was a very weird feeling getting up. And I had made coffee and, and she took off to work and I was sitting there and I did some things and I came back to the living room and Rachel Ray was on TV at nine o'clock. And it was a horror filled moment. I thought, oh my God, I hope none of the neighbors saw the TV and Rachel Ray on. It was a cooking show, it was some sort of an Italian dish. And I thought, this is it. I can't do this. It, it to be fair, I had already started <laughs> mapping what I wanted to do, but I, it, I just could not sit at home. Yeah. And, and I've never been that way. I've always went, tried to be proactive and tried to look ahead a little bit. And so, as I said, I wanted to go back to doing what I enjoyed, maybe grew tired of. And, and so the idea of the photography going back to that was rewarding. I didn't want to cover uh, college sports or high school sports, but I parts, I just don't want to do it full time for an entire season. Right. But one thing I had done with Lee, by the way, which I always appreciated, uh, Mr. Buffett's a bit risk averse when it comes to drones. We wanted to start a drone journalism program with BH. Never were able to get it started, get it off the ground because of worries about liability, which is legitimate. But with Lee, it's an important news gathering tool. Immediately, the VP of news said, go. And so I started a, a, a drone program for not all of the 77 markets, but 26 to 28 of those markets. We identified pilots, trained them to, to pass the FAA certification, and started gathering news with drones. So that was really exciting. Yeah. Fast forward to retirement, I thought one of the things I wanted to do was uh, have drones be an important part of that. So, so let, yeah, and that's what to, I, I want to, yeah. yeah, where you're at today. And let's talk about carnage photography, because if they call you and say, listen, we got a wedding gig next week, you're not taking that call, folks. It's a whole different business that he is in. So at least I don't think so, right? I'm right on that. Right? Weddings. <laughs> okay. I've only done one in my entire life. <laughs> and that was enough? From, from a college roommate at Peru State that I gifted to he and his bride. And it was one time, and I will never do it again. So, <laughs> Brave uh, hand person, but never ever. No, but what, it, yeah, it was what nice it? to pick and choose. So I, I had a lot of connections: the Associated Press, Reuters, USA Today Network, the Washington Post, with a lot of connections with editors from my previous life. 
And so I immediately networked so that if there were news and feature work that they needed to have done, I had that editorial work that would come my way. But that that wasn't as interesting to me. I also, with the drone, looked at, I have neighbors who are real estate agents and wanted me to do aerials of their premier properties and acreages and things that would come for sale. So I enjoyed that too. But I wanted to spend most of my time doing what I never had a chance to do when I was younger and working, which was that that travel and landscape work that and creating photographs that people would want to buy. So I leaned on my skills. I built my website, uh, marketing presence, social accounts. The most painful part of this was explaining to my wife that, by the way, when I worked for media, I never had to buy equipment. 35, 40 years, I never had to buy a camera or a lens. So when I retired, I had that all stayed with the company. So I had to start all over on equipment. So that was a outrageously expensive, aren't they? Yeah. Ridiculous. My daughter is a photographer. Yes. Boy, I sure know. Oh, yeah. my. <laughs> so I figured out a creative way to do that. And, and uh, so then we just were off and running. Yeah. And so. So this is really your first totally entrepreneurial venture, though. I mean, you've got, right? Have you Somebody owned a business before? Was, uh, yeah. I have not. No, yeah. this is my first time. And, and so, yes, that, that there's some pressure. There's some expectations. Revenue is important. And uh, yeah, so that it's, I always felt responsible for revenue, but I never had to write the checks. So let's talk about that person out there that's just getting started in business or they're thinking about taking that big leap. You've just walked through this. What are some steps that you would say you've got to do this to set yourself up for success? Well, stick with drones, for example. Uh, that's a popular. A lot of people want to get their license or their certification and fly. It's a really, really crowded space. There's some bad actors out there that will take advantage of people and have you do work for them for nothing. It's hurt that space from a freelance standpoint or a commercial standpoint. So my advice when you're thinking about what you want to do, no matter what, what the enterprise, the venture, is the emotions, you have to look at it objectively and talk to people that are in that space now that you trust or someone as an advisor that you get recommended and, and, and do your homework first, that the emotions alone uh, can, and we're all that way. We want, like to do the things we're passionate about, but if it's not going to pay the bills, that makes it a bit of a challenge and you're probably doomed from the beginning. So did you sit down and say, did you do the old classic business proposal, you know, the template that said, all right, here is my business plan. Here's how you recommend that. Yeah, abs- without a doubt. And you're going to get pushed back from, I was fortunate that I'm self-funding, I'm bootstrapping this literally myself and with help from, from my wife. But without it, if you're I don't have brick and mortar. I have an online store and, and, and work from home. And so that's a huge advantage there. My overhead is minimal, just equipment. But we agree we're going to pay as we go, not not take a loan out to do any of this. Without a doubt, if you are going to do that, you have to have that. And what a great way, the, you know, the bank, your lender may force that, your investors may force that discipline. But without a well-thought-out plan and knowing, you know, that would be one of my takeaways we talk about later. It's that the competition that is so important to just know what it is you're going up against. And then what's just how many competitors are there in your market? What what are the margins going to be on that effort that you, you want to go into? It's just eyes wide open. Yeah. We were, I was always blessed in the media space to have really good business people, which I learned a lot from. And that especially on the data, again, I go back to the vice president, uh, with BH Media Group and, and doing everything by Excel. But my God, I learned how to uh, understand revenue and being able to look at a, a balance sheet and and see, tr- identify opportunities, identify problems. It, it, it was a great experience for, because you know, we journalists just like to spend the money, not, not make it. <laughs> That's right. And don't forget those fixed costs, right? I mean, you, you got your margins, but if you forget those fixed costs, those margins don't mean as much, do they? Yeah. yeah. So working through all of that, listen, you you have taken a photo. And by the way, this is just going to show how successful this venture is. It's already successful and it's just getting 
bigger and bigger all the time. But tell us about the shot. And, and folks, I want you to make sure you mention your website so they can see this. The shot you got of Chimney Rock. And also the story behind it because you had a just a tiny window to get the lighting just right. So it's hard to make great pictures in your backyard. I think it's... So you do have to get out of Saunders County, where I live now. And there's just some amazing places in Nebraska. And the one thing I wanted to do was document those places. And a lot of them I'd been and photographed in my early in my career. So it's neat to go back to some of these places and, and wide open spaces in the state. And so one of I, last August, I knew I wanted to, I'd gotten my feet underneath me. I had equipment and I, I kept my drones. I still had my drones and but I wanted to do a swing through the sand hills, through the Black Hills, and then my, make my way back home eventually. So I was out on the road for a week, and I looked at Chimney Rock and thought, "What I, I want to take, I'm going to capture some moments, and I want to do it in a way that somebody hasn't seen. It's not shooting at night when the lights are on it. That's been done. Stormy clouds over it. That's been done. Framing it with the windmill. That's been done. Great work, by the way. Oh, but I wanted to try something down. different. So the drone, it was the answer. And so I needed to have cooperation from Mother Nature, meaning a good sky. And I had to have the right angle. So there's an app out there that you can track where the sun's going to go down on the horizon. Sunset, so it was behind to the west of the, the chimney rock. But then it was, where am I going to take off from? Well, that all that ground around Chimney Rock is private. There's the visitor center that's to the west, but there's an old uh, cemetery, Pioneer Cemetery, up on the hill to the southwest of the visitor center. And I thought, there's going to be the closest place for me to take off from and hopefully come back to. But when I'm there in August, that also coincides with the peak activity of rattlesnakes in the sand hills. And it didn't dawn on me until I got there and I got my equipment all out and I'm watching the sun and it's like, okay, this is going to be, this could be a good night. This could be the moment. And I got all my gear ready. And then I realized that for me to, to take off and fly to get the angle that I wanted, um, the FAA has rules about how high and how far away you can go. And I was still within, I was compliant. I was within those rules, which is far enough away. You could barely see the, the strobe going off to mark where the drone was. I could tell on screen and yeah. GPS where it was too, but it just dawned on me when I was out there flying and waiting for the moment and I had enough battery life to capture it and get back safely. I realized what happened if I'd have a fly off, which happens, you lose signal and your, your very expensive drone flies off. I was going to retrieve it come hell or high water, but all I had were, you know, running shoes on and in rattlesnake country <laughs> i just i never came to terms with what i would do if that happened but the good news but you didn't run into one i didn't run into one i did not have to go retrieve the drone it came back i, I managed to fly it back and land it safely and got out of there but so it's just a great moment you never quite know what you have until you edit you get it on the laptop and you see it you never ever predict jinx yourself that you've got the moment and uh, it was it was fun for me. It was the best picture I'd taken of Chimney Rock and over the years. And it was nice to have peers that look at it and say they liked it. So, well, listen, I can tell you it's gorgeous. And you, you've sold some prints to that. And uh, we, I entered for the first time in a very very long time photo contest. That's that's something you used to do when you were younger in your career, trying to establish a name. Uh, Nebraska Land Magazine, fantastic state of Nebraska, Game and Parks publication, still promotes great quality journalism or photojournalism. And so I entered a, a few of my prints or my images in that contest and it ended up winning first place. Not surprised. Yeah. And ran double truck in the magazine. So the best marketing on the planet uh, was that magazine coming out and getting phone calls and people ordering. So it's been fun. I'm doing a limited edition of it so that yeah. we'll number it. And, and I've got it on display in a couple of art galleries in the middle of the state, um, coming to the western part of the state at the the visitor center, and so yeah, it's I love been, it. Been fun. And Grace, I don't know we're coming up to our hour, and she's going to kick us out of here. But Grace, yeah. maybe you can put his email down there. Give us the email here so folks sure. know to Jeff at Carney Photography dot com, and the website is Carney Photography dot com. 
And um, and it's C A R N E Y C A R N E Y hyphen. I love photography.com. Well, listen, you know that I do business coaching, so we got to end up on this. When you think back to those that helped you in business the most, whether it's with this most recent endeavor, whether it was your time at the World Herald or Des Moines Register, who was an instrumental coach or mentor to you in your life, and why was that? I've had I've been really blessed to have a lot of different uh, the the CEO and publisher of the Omaha World Herald Terry Kroger very influential no nonsense laid back guy very effective at communicating in leadership um, Doug Heemster our VP of News at the World Herald at the BH Media Group uh, also very influential he brought that constant hammering of the business side of things that you needed to take that into account. Uh, and I do. I at, at one end of the spectrum, then I go back to that work ethic, my uh, my parents and my my father especially, without a doubt, and patience of my father. I'm not a patient person to this day. Uh, he was pretty patient. He was a patient man. Yeah. yeah. Well, he did. He did a great job well, as your mom did with you. And I'm telling you, what a career. This has been a ball learning about all of this. And um, I tell you, carnet photography is a can't miss so awesome. make sure yeah. folks should check it out as grace will put it here if she hasn't already at the bottom of the screen so you can check out what uh, all the offerings are but jeff this has been fantastic thank you so much absolutely yeah thank you you bet